Hi everyone, my name is Dimitro. I am a PG candidate at Boston University. Today we will talk about anonymous transactions with revocation and auditing functionality in Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. We will start with some background on delegatable anonymous credential schemes and blockchains in general. Permissioned blockchains are the ones where joining a blockchain is an explicit operation. Such blockchains are used, for example, in logistic networks or bank transactions. In some cases, though, the permissioned nature of the blockchain is regulated by law, such as in the cases of know your customer or anti-money laundering laws. Although joining a blockchain is not anonymous, posting a transaction can be. Anonymous credentials let parties prove that they are a part of a blockchain without revealing their identity. To this end, we'd like to have a scheme that allows delegation, when a root authority delegates to an organization which further issues user credentials, and we obviously want such scheme to support arbitrary lengths of delegation chain. We also want the scheme to embed arbitrary number of attributes along the way, for example, the fact that the bearer is a member of an organization. Finally, such scheme needs to be fast and easily natively integratable into the blockchain. On top of these features, a real-world mechanism must support revocation and auditing. Let me compose an example. Suppose that the US now wants to issue anonymous IDs in the form of a digital driving license. Suppose now that a person wishes to make a transaction, such as buying a beverage, anonymously. This person must demonstrate that they possess a valid ID, and on top of that, that the age in ID is no less than 21. Suppose now a state wants to suspend that license for any reason, like unpaid fines. And finally, suppose that the government wants to retain an ability to decipher some of the transactions in the future, but only following a strict process. Our goal in this paper is to construct a mechanism that can be used in such example. Let's start with blockchain web targeting. <coughs> Hyperledger Fabric is our choice since it is efficient, permissioned, and natively integrates with a non-delegatable primitive authorization mechanism. A very simplified Fabric deployment consists of these parties. A client is a user application which initiates a transaction through the SDK. Peers are the nodes running in the network that, among other things, called the ledger. Auditors are the nodes whose sole purpose is to order transactions, pack them into blocks, and distribute to the peers. All parties can talk to each other through the gossip protocol, and they all talk to an MSP. A membership service provider, MSP, is the component responsible for everyone's identities. This is the component we target. Fabric has a unique execute or revalidate transaction process. Client first sends the transaction to endorsers, a set of peers that run the transaction in isolation and sign the result of it, the read-write sets. With the endorsements, the client constructs a transaction object and sends it to orders. Orders order, pack, and distribute the transaction. Finally, all peers verify the transaction by checking the endorsements and that the result of the transaction matches the endorsed one. This is a simplified depiction of a delegatable anonymous credential scheme we base our work on. Such a scheme has a key generation component, which generates a pair of public and secret keys for each participant. Delegation routine produces the next level credential embedding the attributes on that level and the public key of the requester. This credential can be checked for validity at any level with respect to the root authority. Presentation routine generates a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof of the credential with all its components on all levels uh, and, and, and verify that the credential is valid and belongs to the presenter. One can specify which attributes to disclose in the proof and can optionally sign a message while presenting the credential. Verification routine can be run on the credential with respect to the disclosed attributes the message, and the root authority public key. Finally, the authors of the original delegatable scheme show how to instantiate it with Groth and Schnorr signatures in alternating bilinear groups.
Now let's talk about the extensions and improvements we've made to the integration of this scheme uh, with the blockchain. Our first extension is revocation. Classical revocation mechanism is in conflict with anonymity in general. Think of it. How can you revoke someone you don't know? What we propose is using epoch-based whitelisting. The idea is to split the timeline into epochs and let identities be valid in an epoch. In the case of blockchain, its height defines the timeline, the epoch lapses either naturally by wall clock time, or the number of transactions, or if a special transaction is put by admins. To enforce this, we bind the current epoch in the credential. We propose two ways to instantiate the idea. The simplest case is using epoch as one of the attributes, given that our scheme naturally supports the attributes. It is natural and fast, however it requires that the credential issuer is also the revocation authority. To overcome this limitation and to decouple one from the other, we propose an explicit proof of non-revocation. We use gross signature and sign a hash of the epoch. We then embed the signature into the credential and proof generation. This is a proof expression. The first three terms are the Groth and Schnorr signatures for the regular de delegatable credential scheme, and Boxed is a new component that we efficiently embed. The second extension is auditing. A natural approach for auditing is to encrypt the real user ID and include it with the transaction. What makes it interesting, however, is that one needs to prove that the encrypted is the correct key and the encryption is valid under the auditor's key. All of that in the presence of anonymous credentials. The way we instantiate this one is we use Elgamal encryption. We encrypt the public key with it and generate a proof that validates that the encrypted key is the same as in credentials, that the encryption key is the same as the auditor's, and that the encryption itself is valid. And here is how the final proof looks like. On top of earlier components, we also prove the facts about auditing encryption. Uh, in order to make the entire scheme practical, we offer a few optimizations. We start with the refactoring and corrections of the algorithm in the original delegatable scheme. We then discover a way to parallelize the construction with the proper granularity. Granularity of commitments is fine enough to uniformly disperse the load among given resources and coarse enough to neglect the cost of spawning an extra threat. Finally, we globally apply the idea that in computing a pairing, which is overwhelmingly the most frequent and expensive operation, we compute the Miller's loops first and apply the final exponentiation once per product. We also notice that, subject to implementation, one group may be cheaper to compute exponentiation in, so we use only that group for the operation. At the end of the day, we want our scheme to be integrated in the blockchain. Here is how we do it schematically. We start with issuing the credentials. For all adjacent levels, the parties generate the keys, a delegatee proves the ownership of its public key, and asks the delegator to produce the credential for given attributes. This process repeats for L levels. This part repeats at each epoch. Conceptually, the process is similar but occurs between the end user and the revocation authority. The user proves the ownership of the public key and asks the authority to give the non revocation handler for the current epoch. This is the most interesting part. Assuming the user has valid credentials and non-revocation handler from the earlier stages, here is how it prepares the transaction. First, the user encrypts its own public key. It then generates the pseudonym, a Peterson commitment, that is needed to link the transaction to its author. The user generates the proof of non-revocation, then the proof of auditing, and finally the proof of credential validity, the presentation routine from the scheme. The user then sends these proofs along with the transaction payload and the receiving part, the peers, verifies that all the components are valid. This verification step happens on all peers for every transaction. Now let's talk about the experimental evaluation. 
We have implemented all of these algorithms and more, like marshalling and unmarshalling objects, as a Go library which we open source. We used open source AMCL library for low level cryptographic operations, which itself uses Barrett on AREF curve. We have run each of the benchmarks 100 times on a medium sized GCP instance. We use two levels, two attributes each by default, as is the typical fabric deployment where there is a root authority, an organization, and attributes representing membership. To fully benchmark the integration, we implemented a distributed fabric prototype. We also note that our benchmark methodology is different from the one in the original schemes paper. We use different languages, our benchmarks involve no pre-computations, and even without revocation and auditing, our scheme computes more commitments for integration with fabric. We structure our experiments to answer six questions on evaluation. First, what is the optimization's performance benefit? To answer that, we toggled our optimizations, parallelization and smart computation of parent products, and we conclude that our optimizations over offer almost five-fold improvement in the running time. Second, how does the scheme scale with the number of levels and attributes? For that, we generate credentials for different number of levels and attributes, and we record the time it takes to present a proof, to validate it, and the size of the proof object. We observe that the relation is linear in both the number of levels and attributes per level. Third, what overhead do our extensions impose? We run the routines for our extensions in isolation and report the running times. We observe that with exception of verification of non-revocation handle, the extensions are fast compared to the entire credential construction and validation and the entire transaction processing overhead. Fourth, how does the system compare to the old non-delegatable IDNX? We ran our system against the older IDMX that is currently used in Fabric and against the plain X509 protocol in non-IDMX version. We used the actual Fabric code to run the IDMX and prototype the non-IDMX version in Go. We report that it takes five times more time to generate a proof of anonymous credential than the plain one and then just twice as much to have a delegated credential. Fifth, how practical is maintaining a single and possibly distributed revocation authority? One may wonder, would the revocation authority be a bottleneck, both in terms of load of a single server and network usage? We have coded up a detailed network telemetry in our prototype, and we observe that the revocation requests do not result in spike of latency, even for relatively short epochs. We also ran a torrent of requests against a single remote server that only process non-revocation requests and we observed that it can take at least 200 requests per second. We conclude that our revocation mechanism is practical. Finally, we implemented a distributed prototype of the entire transaction processing with respect to the authorization. We ran two organizations, five users and three peers in a network like the shown. Organizations are located in geographically distributed regions and all parties talk to each other over the real network. We measured the average time it takes to completely process a transaction, tuning the number of users, peers and required endorsements and we toggled our extensions. We report a couple of observations. First, the number of endorsements does not affect the overhead much because endorsements are processed in parallel. Greater number of users generates more transactions and the overhead grows linearly. The number of peers also affect the overhead because in our prototype the transaction is completed when the last peer has validated it. The last peer is typically in a distant region. We conclude that the integration of our scheme is efficient. Uh, thank you for listening to this presentation. Please don't hesitate to contact us with any questions.